good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Missy Bender, and I am a regional advocacy director for Raise Your Hand Texas, which is a nonpartisan education advocacy organization. Thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you to the Dallas Regional Chamber and the North Texas Commission for co-sponsoring, along with Raise Your Hand Texas, this responsible return to the workplace event designed specifically for education facilities. Together, we want to thank the five panelists that you will meet shortly. Today's panelists are joining us from organizations that either have continued to operate throughout the pandemic or have already reopened. The businesses and organizations that they represent possess attributes that are similar to schools, and they will share some valuable lessons learned. This will be followed by a question and answer opportunity. We appreciate that Dr. Gordon Taylor, Executive Director for the Region 10 Education Service Center, has also joined us on the call and will be available if needed for any technical guidance related to the Texas Education Agency. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Mayor Karen Hunt, Vice Chair of the North Texas Commission. Karen. North Texas Commission Board of Directors and the staff appreciate the opportunity to collaborate. Um, with the Raise Your Hand Texas and the um, Dallas Regional Chamber. Um, the North Texas children represent our future workforce, and we believe that um, they are the backbone of the communities, and we really need to spe uh, spend special attention on them. We appreciate the um, generosity of our panelists uh, for them to be sharing their practices. And we also um, appreciate the educators who have decided to join us today. Um, your stature in the world, uh, especially in Texas, has been raised dramatically since last March. Uh, people really understand the um, trials and tribulations and the patience that our teachers have for um, all of our children. Um, I am, for one, am very thankful that my children are grown and have children of their own and they can deal with this kind of stuff. But um, this next few months are going to be very unique and really unprecedented uh, in our future. So um, we're happy that everybody is here and that North Texas Commission is a part of it. and. I uh, hope that the panelists will give you a nugget or five or six that you can implement in your schools. Thank you again for allowing us to be a part of it. So I'm Michelle Lobby and I'm the vice chair, not the vice chair, the chair elect of Dallas Regional Chamber. And I just wanted to make a couple of comments before we got start get started. Um, First of all, thank you to our partners, Raise Your Hand Texas and the North Texas Commission. Second, I wanted to brag a little bit about the, the Dallas Regional Chamber. Um, as the COVID crisis emerged in March, it just seemed like overnight that DRC moved from being largely an in-person convening reception type organization to full, full digital content delivery. Um, very, very important topics that they've been covering and the communication and collaboration with the chamber and the North Texas businesses have been really incredible. And so I'm very proud to be part of DRC. Um, this is an important topic, as Mayor Hunt mentioned. Um, as a mom of a college student, a high school student, and a middle school student, I, I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges other than the healthcare issues themselves that COVID-19 is bringing to all of us. Um, so important to get our kids back to school, but so important to keep protect them, protect our faculty and staff and protect the parents and grandparents. Um, I think it touches all of us. And I, um, I know there's a lot of anxiety around the return to, to school. And I know you all are doing everything the very best that you can. So thank you for your um, commitment to educating our kids and getting them back in the classroom if it's safe. Um, I did want to connect why DRC would be having an education type um, event. We are very, very focused on education. Educated 
Um, people feed our workforce. So from pre-K to college to workforce skills, DRC is very, very committed and has been for many years to these areas. They have staff dedicated to education and workforce issues. They have a terrific education and workforce council. So this is a very natural addition to our return to work program. This is the seventh one that we've had. And again, I think it may be the most important one. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah um, Parabias Rush, our SVP of Economic Development, who will moderate today's discussion. Thank you so much, Michelle. Really uh, appreciate your support and uh, for, for always showing up to be a part of these sessions with us. I know we've, we've appreciated it. I can't reiterate enough uh, what Michelle just said about how important uh, today's conversation is. Um, this has been uh, an area that, you know, as a as a mom of a soon to be five year old, you know, I am I'm anxious to see schools reopen. Um, I am increasingly appreciative of all the work that teachers do uh, day in and day out. I am appreciative of the administrators um, and all the work that that you all do. And I know that this has to be the single most difficult time uh, in each of your careers, uh, making decisions that will affect not only the lives of your students, but the lives of your teachers and staff. And we um, we we feel that, we, we understand that. And so we just want today to be able to bring you some resources that can help you as you're trying to make these very difficult and very important decisions. Um, you know, this there is not a playbook for for what we are going through right now. Um, but we do have some fantastic uh, folks that are on today's call. Um, I'm going to introduce them for the sake of time as we uh, go through this first round of questions. Um, and each panelist, if you feel like you want to um, uh, add any additional background about your experiences, please feel free. But we have a short amount of time here. Yeah. Our goal will be to wrap up at about um, 10 o'clock, but we will keep the lines open afterwards for about 15 minutes for anyone that has any additional questions or wants to follow up on anything that you heard today. Um, please use the um, chat function uh, to enter in any questions that you have or raise your hand. Um, if you're on the phone and unable to get a question in, you might just uh, quickly email that to one of our staff. I think that will expedite um, making sure we get through as much as possible today. Um, and I will give you the name of Casey Rodriguez. Uh, her email is crodriguez at dallaschamber.org and she can um, take your questions and facilitate those back to us this morning. Um, so just quickly, we will start today's conversation, um, I think with uh, an organization that has been in the news quite a bit about um, the work that they are doing supporting essential workers and families. Um, we are lucky to have Tony Schumann, the CEO of YMCA Fort Worth, with us this morning. Um, we would love to hear from you, Tony, about what has worked well in the operations of the, the YMCA's youth summer camps and what hasn't gone quite as well, and what learnings you can share with our educators today um, that you'll keep and what you will do differently as you move forward. Thank you. Well, it's, a, it's an honor to be with, with all of you. Uh, the YMCA um, looks at itself as an as a integral partner with the schools uh, during the school year and during the summer. Um, we still, we all serve the, the same constituency. And um, again, it's like you, it's been, um, it's been a challenge uh, this summer. By, by this time in the summer, usually we're ready to give them all back to you. Uh, but right now we're just now just, um, just getting, I think, into the swing of things um, with the new policies, new procedures and so forth. Let me say too that my wife is a high school principal, so I understand your side of, of this as well. So um, I'm going to give you some stuff that, that has worked well for us. Um, I'm, I tried to, to look at things that would be relatable, I think, to the, to the schools. And, and as you reopen, some of the things that, that you need to look at, um, you know, of course, we had to revise our, our program for the summer. Um, we, we are providing any transportation, um, and I know that, that one of our, our speakers is on transportation. We decided not to do any busing, not to do any field trips, um, and really just kind of um, concentrate on, on activities that we can do right there, either at the YMCA or at our summer camps. 
Um, I would say one of the things that is really, um, it's gone well, and it's something that uh, I think that we will keep moving forward. And it's something that, uh, you know, I was talking to my wife about with, with you all, and um, thinking through the drop off and pick up process for schools, I think is gonna be really, really important for y'all. Um, you know, for us, it's it, it was a completely, it was kind of, I wouldn't call it a free for all, but parents would drive in, drop their kids off, we'd check them in, we'd do group games, they would leave and, you know, then uh, our staff, we'd have a morning staff and then uh, their counselors would come at nine o'clock and we'd have organized games and activities. Well, we've had to completely change that, um, that morning drop off and pick up into where we've got specific staff that take the temperature of each child as, as they show up. Uh, we have another staff person who I'll say quizzes the, um, the parents on a, a couple of health safety questions. Uh, after we get the right answers and they have the right temperature, then they go to the kids get out of the car and they go to a, I'll call it a sanitation station where they wash their hands and, and so forth and so on and put their, their, their gear, their backpacks up and, and so forth. Uh, and then each counselor um, is, is on call or on staff from the minute that we open the doors to camp. And that's a little bit different for us because you can't mix the groups anymore, right? So it used to be everybody kind of had a, we had a morning staff that would do stuff. And then at nine o'clock, they'd go to their individual counselors. Now our individual counselors are, are there in the morning so they can keep their groups together because there really isn't any co-mingling going on uh, for safety reasons. So, you know, that is something that is is, is changed. And, and that that brings up for us a whole lot of other, you know, challenges, if you will, when it comes to our budget when it comes to what we have to charge for, for day camp and so forth, um, because we have more staff on site at all times. And sometimes we're at a one-to-one -one ratio uh, if uh, in the morning or in the afternoon. So the, the same process happens in the, in the afternoon and when the parents drive up and their counselor will take them to their car and, and, and so forth and so on. So, you know, that is something that I, I really think um, that you guys need to get your head wrapped around that the morning drop off and pick up in the afternoon needs to probably be, completely revamped and thought through. Um, again, most of our activities during the summertime are outside. So that's been an advantage for us. Um, we have utilized um, our swimming pools quite a bit more. Um, you know, again, you're, you're swimming in a big vat of hand sanitizer. So we feel like that that's a, uh, that's a really safe activity for kids, but we don't have as many kids in the pool at, at, at the same time. We maybe have two groups in the pool at a time, but the kids are swimming every day. So that's been a, a great activity for us. Um, and then, um, you know, the man we have mandatory sanitation breaks for, for staff and for campers. Um, so in the middle of the day, they'll just head to the, the, the restroom and they'll, they'll, they'll wash their hands. And, and again, there's an education process that I think that we're doing a pretty good job of educating these kids so that hopefully when they get to you all, they'll kind of be in a routine that that's going to be a regular part of their day. Um, but uh, it, that has been a, something new for us. But We've got, you know, most of our staff are college age kids, uh, very energetic, very um, uh, innovative, and, and they've made a, a really good game uh, about uh, the, the sanitation pace. You can hear the kids singing in the bathroom, the 20 seconds and so forth. So that's been been kind of fun. Um, you know, a, a, the other thing for us, and I, I, I assume that it's going to be the same for you, is that uh, all the kids brought their own individual uh, supplies, whether that's crayons, whether that's pens, pencils, uh, craft supplies, you know, we, we're providing some paper and, and stuff, but they're, they're bringing the glue and the, all the things that you need to do to, to, um, uh, to get a, a really good, uh, fun time with those kids, uh, there and in, in, in a safe atmosphere. Um, so, you know, those are, I think the things that have worked well for us. Um, some of the challenges, as I said, the, the budget side of things with, with less, we have stricter ratios, uh, which is adding to our costs, um, having to rotate groups separately through activities rather than doing big, large group games. Um, and some of the challenges that I don't think that you'll face as much as that we face is that, it, you know, again, depending on the age, it's hard for kids to social distance, right? And it's, it's um, you, can, you can recognize that these, some of these kids haven't seen their friends for a long time. And what's your first reaction is to run and give them a big hug. And, and doing the education part of, of why we're not gonna go give them a big hug and, and some of that stuff is, has been a, a challenge and it's almost heartbreaking sometimes too. 
um, you know, watching those kids that they just really want to just hang out with their with their friends. Um, we were un, unprepared, I think, a little bit to go completely paperless in our, our registration processes and um, the notes home uh, to parents and how the day went and and for us to um, to kind of have to pull back and 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 again hire some different staff to be able to send those via email and and things like that rather than sending stuff home with campers was a little bit um, challenging for us. Um, it, we've had some difficulty with the the PPP, PPE supplies and and making sure that we have enough on hand, uh, but not to the point where it's it's been dangerous. But we get dangerously low, but We've got about five or six different camps going on, so we were able to share between uh, each of the the different Ys. Um, and you know, this is going to be a. I don't know if it'll be a challenge for you all, but again, our staff basically the ages are eighteen or nineteen to twenty one or twenty two. And if you've been watching the news, you recognize that 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 group is a, is a challenge. So when it comes to their extracurricular activities, if you will. So we've had a little bit of challenge where, we, where staff, when they're not working for us, are doing things that are probably not as safe. And um, we're, we're getting a few staff that uh, are out because they're sick. And, and that's been a challenge uh, for us that we've been kind of working through. Um, and then the same thing for us when it comes to, to virtual staff training. Uh, we've, done a, we've moved a lot of our staff training to, to virtual. Um, and we haven't we're not good enough to, or we haven't developed a program enough to make sure that folks are actually watching the training when they're when we're giving training. Uh, so, you know, up, upping our game, I think a little bit there has been a um, uh, a challenge for us. And things, you know, that we may do differently. Um, we probably should have started with a mandatory mask policy um, uh, because it's it's easier to roll back things than to roll up things that we found. Um, so, you know, as the, the regulations have changed, it's become a more of a challenge to get some of the kiddos to, to wear some of those, those masks and so forth. Um, some other things that we might do differently is we'd probably do a better job of preparing our kids and campers before the first day of camp. And we put together some, some, some short videos of, quote unquote, what to expect. Um, and I think we probably needed to go into more detail um, in, in that situation. So I think that that would be something, you know, again, looking at thinking through the eyes of my wife, who's a, a high school principal, to, to really develop some videos of what to expect on the first day of school or what to expect, uh, you know, moving forward um, so that they have a, um, a little bit of normalcy when they show up that first day. Because a lot of kids, especially the five, six, seven, eight-year-olds are, you know, they're looking up there like they don't have any idea what's going on. And and I think we could have done a better job of that. And again, I said, you know, probably doing a better job of virtual training. And it, it really brought to, to our attention that we need to upgrade our, our Wi-Fi systems and our technology and so forth to be more effective and efficient with those parents and, and those kiddos. So, um you know, I'd say those are our main learnings that that apply to to your group. I, I did, would like to say that you know that we appreciate the why appreciates my colleagues in Arlington and Dallas appreciate the relationships that we have with the schools, and we recognize that uh, this is a challenging year. But you know, we're all in this together, and the why is there to to help support your after school activities and so forth. And we're we're going to stand right next to you and, and be a partner with you as much as we possibly can. Thanks so much for that, Tony. We had a couple of questions that popped up in the feed. I would normally wait to the end, but they were uh, somewhat specific, so it might be easy for us to just address them now. Um, okay. How many kids at once do you receive during drop-off? Well, it, it, you know, each, car, each we have about um, a max of about 50 kids in each one of our camps, um, and we've got a, some specific drop-off time. So, you know, those 50 kids arrive sometime between 7 a.m., and 8 30 a.m so um it's it's kind of you know there's there, you've seen you know some of the, the 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 lines if you will of cars just kind of waiting in line and and so it, it takes us a little bit more time to get through that uh, at our camp carter uh location we can take more kids uh and sometimes the, the line is even a little bit longer out there so parents need to to, to recognize it's not going to be just a quick in drop them off and get out takes a little more time. Yeah, one of the the um, mindsets that we're encouraging everyone right now during this time to practice is 
flexibility and grace that goes and patience. With <laughs> and patience lots and lots of patience <laughs> Um, OK, thanks so much for for asking that. I assume uh, based on the, the state guidelines now that require masks in groups, you have all staff and uh, kids wearing masks at this correct. time, is that correct? We do. OK, except when they're in the, in the swimming pool. Obviously, we're not going to make them wear masks in the swimming pool. Awesome. Um, we're going to come back to the temperature question, uh, Dr. Uh, Smalskis. I don't know if I said that right, but um, we will come back to that because I think there's some technology we could discuss uh, that, that might support that. Um, so thanks so much, Tony. We'll, we'll come back to you throughout the discussion. Moving on now uh, to um, busing. I know many of you are uh, busing students in and out of the schools, and um, obviously Tony has decided not to. We, we felt like it would be important for you all to hear from DART. Uh, so today we're lucky to have with us Carol Wise, the Chief Operating Officer at DART. And uh, for Carol, we asked her to address as schools prepare to transport children and school buses. How has DART continued to operate public transportation and protect both its passengers and employees? And um, Elizabeth Thompson will pull up uh, some slides that I know, Carol, you would like to walk through. All right. Good morning. Uh, it, it, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And um, of course, COVID is the topic of the day, and it's a critical uh, element of the whole society. And so um, I'm happy to share some of the issues and concerns that we've gone through uh, here at DART and hope that, hope that s some of our analysis and evaluation will be useful to you. Uh, first, let me just say that DART operates 365 days a year, 22 hours a day, and we have 681 buses and over 1,300 operators that travel through our service area of approximately 700 square miles uh, per day through 13 member cities. So we have a large breadth and depth of our vehicles and our essential workers who are working throughout the service area. So next slide. So uh, one of the things that we found very useful is our executive leadership team and our president and executive director appointed DART's chief safety officer and emergency management manager to lead and coordinate the agency through the COVID crisis. And so this executive team, what we like to call our plan ahead team, meets every day through teams at 7.30, 8 a.m. each morning. And so that conference call is to update and inform daily communication, what has happened out in the field, on the ground, what have we heard from our customers, what are we hearing from our employees, our service delivery and ridership. And then secondly, uh, our leadership the safety officer and the man, uh, emergency management manager has daily calls with the North Texas Transit Agencies to balance service and rider needs throughout the community, as well as communication with all of the various local and regional medical uh, facilities and doctors throughout the area. Next slide. Uh, DART remains committed to everything, to doing everything possible to keep our patrons and our employees safe. So we've worked aggressively to expand agency-wide cleaning and safety protocols in response to COVID. And so again, we remain in co close contact with local, state, and national health authorities, including the state, uh, Texas Department of State Health Services and the CDC and continue to monitor that situation for residents in North Texas. Next slide. Next slide, okay. So, um, I'm sorry, go back. We moved too fast there, okay. Uh, serving our customers and caring for our employees are at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, and so, one of the things that we've done uh, is to communicate not only to our customers and our employees 
through our website, through social media, uh, through YouTube, through advertising on our interior vehicles, uh, as well as on our buses and our trains, TV and radio and public service announcements. And so we want to get that information out there uh, to all of our riders and customers. And we want to make sure that they know about PPE, that there's social distancing on our DART vehicles. We implemented rear door boarding on all of our DART vehicles uh, several months ago. Uh, we've provided operator barriers to protect employees and riders on our vehicles, and that's on all of our buses, on the 681 of our buses. And then we have signage and messaging throughout the DART network. Next slide. So in accordance with Governor Abbott's executive order beginning um, at noon on July 3rd, DART passengers are required to wear face masks, uh, to wear face coverings while on DART vehicles or properties. So DART operators are also providing masks to the riders who need them. So not only do we have the operators, but we have police officers, fair enforcement officers, uh, DART staff that are on our platforms and in our, at our transit centers who are distributing masks to anyone who doesn't have one. Next slide. So some of our cleaning protocols on our vehicles and our facilities. So we uh, has a, have a mass effort in terms of not only our bus cleaning, but in our facilities as well. So our bus cleaning, we have daily cleaning in the morning, midday cleaning when buses come back off of the street from our AM rush to the midday, and then we have nightly cleaning. And so that cleaning process includes uh, Victory electrostatic spraying, our halo foggers, uh, we also have on our buses a germicidal uh, UV violet light. We have innovation, uh, 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 an electronic system that is, that's also uh, on our buses. And we have a biohazard cleaning contract so that uh, if there's a biohazard issue on any of our buses or trains, uh, well, we have a professional contractor. And so what we did was we added an additional uh, task order to that contract that spe specifically address any, uh, not only in our facilities, in our workplace, but on our buses, if we know of anyone who um, has uh, the virus. That vehicle is taken out of service, I mean, out of, uh, out of service, and in our facilities as well. Uh, they come into that facility, into that work office, or into that building and clean and literally sweep that whole facility. Next slide. So this is just an example of some of the different types of products that we're using. Uh, again, I've already mentioned the sprayer, the fogger, uh, hand cleaning and disinfecting that's being done by our employees. We've hired a large crew uh, temporary employees to come in and assist us as well. Next slide. So I've, I've mentioned about the daily and nightly cleaning. Uh, high touch surfaces and areas are cleaned with EPA approved cleaning agencies, uh, agents. Uh, high touch surfaces, our handrails, our doors, uh, grab rails, uh, all of those things are part of our process. Next slide. On our light rail vehicles, same type of effort is carried throughout the light rail vehicles. Uh, let me just say that we do have a large segment of our population of school aged children who ride DART to, um, to school on our buses as well as our rail system. So we want them to be aware of the surfaces that they're touching, not only on our buses, but our trains as well. So at each end of our eight uh, termos stations on the rail side, uh, we do have uh, temporary employees who are cleaning those trains as they come into each one of those termos stations. So if you're on the red line uh, or the blue line, 
uh, the red line, they're cleaned every 60 minutes. And on the orange and green line, and you come into the end of that terminus, it's every 90 minutes. Next slide. And so I've mentioned that we have a operator security barrier that's on our all of our buses, and that's to protect not only the operator, but employ, uh, customers as well. There is a, a, a little slot there for anybody who gets on one of our buses. Uh, we have operators that can hand them uh, a face mask through that little slot. Next slide. Again, we have uh, literature throughout um, our whole system about wearing a face mask, maintaining a six foot uh, spatial distancing, um, and being courteous to fellow riders and operators as well. Next slide. Uh, again, this is another uh, image of what it looks like on our buses uh, to remind people to social distance. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that we're piloting right now is uh, we're putting sanitizer uh, on our buses and our trains as well as a, a face mask um, dispenser. So uh, we hope to have all of that done uh, by the end of August on all of our vehicles. Next slide. Uh, and then as we go through all of this, uh, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that we still want to serve our community. And so we've been engaged in a number of projects throughout uh, the service area, partnering with the city of Dallas to distribute care packages to seniors and delivering food and medicine partnering with Catholic Charities to deliver meals. And so uh, we want to remind the community that not only are we providing transportation, uh, but we want to give back to the community as well. So uh, several things that I do want to keep in mind in terms of lessons learned. Uh, leadership of the process is very and very important. So your, your top leadership, communicating to your employees so that they maintain communication and transparency as you go through this process, that you remind them um, of all of the safety measures, not only for themselves, but their families as well, and maintaining communication and feedback from your employees is a critical, critical element, especially for us because they are our essential workers and they're on the front line. So we want to make sure that we're communicating with them on a daily basis. And then also for us receiving feedback from our customers when they don't feel safe, when they see something that happens out on one of our buses or our trains on our platforms. We've encouraged all of our uh, customers to, to use our Dart app so that they, they see something, they can either take a picture or they can also uh, text us so that we can address the issue immediately. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to uh, participate today. Thank you so much, Carol. I know that was very helpful uh, for the audience and we'll come back to any questions um, that, that folks may have as we move through the uh, this morning's presentation. So up next, I would um, please to introduce Michael Proker. Uh, he is the Director of Support Services with Boy Scouts Circle 10 Council. Um, and Michael, we would love to hear from you about how Boy Scouts are approaching its interactions with younger versus older Scouts. And how have you addressed parent concerns and built their trust that their children will be safe during this time? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's great to be here. I also uh, want to uh, echo what Tony said about uh, the partnerships that we have between the school systems and the scouting programs. Um, so I have a slide that uh, I brought up that I sent in. If you guys could put up the slide, the COVID slide I had, because um, what what we did, I just want to make sure you guys knew we we uh, were worried about if COVID was going to impact our camps way back in January and February, and then obviously more in March. Uh, but from day one, if you want to go ahead and go to the second slide, 
uh, from day one, we knew that we were going to move forward full steam ahead and not hesitate on running our camps, but we were going to wait on the governor's orders. But we knew we had to be prepared uh, to run the camps, and so we did not uh, hesitate on ordering all of our supplies and additional supplies that were going to be needed, such as the PPE and the masks and, and anything you can think of, sanitizer, hundreds and hundreds of gallons of hand sanitizer to be at four different camps and two offices during the entire summer. Um, but uh, so I put together this slide to kind of explain a number of things that we personally did. And I'll kind of explain uh, a little bit more in detail about these different words, but I took COVID and obviously like the military and the Boy Scouts, we love to have an afternoons for everything. So I went ahead and started one over here for us with communications. Uh, we started our communications uh, uh, virtually as soon as possible. And I would say that was uh, right about in March. We continue to communicate all the time with all of our parents and staff and uh, camp staffs and employees um, whenever we had facts and new information to put out and we weren't afraid to say we didn't know and there were times where we just didn't know uh, until a governor would say something so we but we continue to communicate um, through virtual communication through zoom and we would have hundreds of people on the zoom calls and they were very appreciative of that information that we shared with them uh, there were times where we do have uh, youth staff as well. So um, as a school, you may have to figure out what is appropriate to discuss with youth and what is not depending on their age, but that's something you guys have to figure out as, as a school. Um, but we did we communicated mostly with parents and our staff and we actually combined those meetings. We never separated only just parents. We're only going to talk to parents tonight or we're only going to talk to staff tonight. We brought everybody in, so everybody got the exact same message all the time. Um, the other part was observation. Um, you had to oversee the operations uh, in full. And <clears throat> so we had to practice um, what we were going to do when it came to the dining hall or to the bathrooms or check in and check out, uh, sleeping, all those types of questions that parents mostly were worried about, which would be how are you going to feed our children safely? How are they going to be in a classroom safely? And what are you going to do if someone gets sick? And and those were questions that the parents had, but we found a way to make sure that we had a plan in place, whether it, if someone became ill or sick, or if we had to deal with a situation, we had a plan in place and we practiced the plan before we had to before we had to put anything in, in into action. Uh, but making sure your staff is practicing is, is probably very important. And then be versatile. Uh, versatile, but um, we had to adapt the plan to everything. Um, and this is uh, one of the things I learned ac actually in church one night. <laughs> one day was uh, a virtual church thing, and, and the pastor said, uh, we can't expect to go back to the way it was. Um, we have to go forward. And going forward actually became a great opportunity for us to adapt new and uh, ideas that we would not have thought of without COVID. And those ideas are um, actually probably going to be in place forever now. And it's things we just never would have thought of. And they're things that you're going to find out as you work through your plan. Uh, because change is good. And, and, and we just can't expect everything to go back to the way it was because it's, it's moving forward and it's going to stay that way. Um, I personally inspected and had my staff and in personally inspect, watch, but also participate, which meant um, staff and supervisors in your case, principals and teachers went through the same procedures as the youth, and we did that prior to camp. So we made sure, and I personally made sure, what was it like to go through check-in? How long is it going to take? How long is it going to take to go through a meal line? How many people can we fit into a bathroom safely? Um, so we actually practiced and actually participated in all this type of um, activities ourselves before the campers did. Um, and then one of the main thing, one of the things I love to say is management by walking around. I, I was never sitting down. I was always moving around whenever I visited a camp and I was always inspecting what I expected out of the camp staff and the management teams on play on, on scene. Uh, and then the decision making. You have to be able to make a decision and. I personally had to make decisions 
that affected parents, leaders, and kids to keep everybody safe. And you have to be able to make the decisions. And it was difficult because what we wrote down on the plan is much different when you have to actually act on it. And that was a very touching situation one day when I had to send home six campers. So I apologize for getting emotional. Um, I have a 42 page document that I provided Missy. That document is going to outline every single thing that we did throughout our entire camps. And I'm, I'm here to tell you right now we have had zero issues at any of our camps and facilities um, since we put the plan into place. It was a, a very detailed plan that we worked very hard with um, both Senator West and, uh, and and all of our volunteers and all of our staffs to make sure that the plan would be implemented correctly and at all times. And uh, so I shared that document. You're welcome to pass it, but, <clears throat> but I'd just say thank you for letting me be here and I hope I can be some help. Thank you so much. And we we recognize just how difficult these decisions are. And I think we want to reiterate that there's no need to apologize for being emotional. These are incredibly difficult times. Sarah, um, this is Gordon Taylor. Could you get Michael before he goes to talk about their food service? Because that was a critical part of their program that the schools are going to need to deal yeah. with too. Yeah, thank you. Gordon. I, I provided some photos. If you guys want to throw up a bunch of photos, um, I'm not sure Elizabeth if they have that ability to do that. Yeah. I think Elizabeth can pull those up. She's working on it. I can talk about these photos, Gordon. Um, so as as I saw in one of your chats here, uh, food service, this is the hot spot that I considered at camp. This is where kids are not wearing their masks as they're eating. They're using their hands and they're touching their mouth. And to me, this was the hottest spot on camp. So I had to change everything that we did. So everything that you see in this first slide is that anything that used to be in a bottle or a salt shaker or anything you can think of was individually wrapped. Uh, you can go to the next picture. I can discuss the next photo. As you can see here, this is a dining facility. This picture was probably taken. This, this picture was probably taken. Uh, mid July or first week of July, but our staff is in yellow and the participants obviously are sitting down and eating. If you'll notice, we have very limited amount of people at each table. Those tables would seat 12, but we would only put the maximum of six people at any certain table. And at all times, our staff was always, uh, you, you don't see one here, but they had those little pool noodles that uh, kids play with in the pool. We used pool noodles to keep people spaced out um, before they would actually go into um, pick up their food. So you can go to the next one real quick if you'd like. Um, as you can see, the people behind the scenes are with masks and gloves on. Those are our food handlers through the state system of making sure that they're they're certified through that system. They put the food on the plates. At no time was a a child or staff or anybody uh, touching the tongs or putting food on a plate or behind the scenes or behind the counter. And those and the trays were put, <clears throat> the food was put on the tray and placed out for the for the camp to pick up or adult to pick up. So at no time were they anywhere near the actual food that was being served to other people. And you can see here we actually at this point we were using the metal forks because we had the correct sanitizer and dishwasher uh, <clears throat> that we were allowed to do that. Prior to that, we were under all disposable utensils. Go to the next one if you want real quick. As you can see, this is where the staff is in orange and he plates places the plates down and then the camper picks up a picks up a tray and goes. They also when they ate, they did not get in line to throw their stuff away. They left their stuff at the tables and our staff went around and picked up all of the trays off the tables and put them in the trash can. That would that would keep us from having large lines of people trying to throw things away. You can go to the next one if you want real quick. Again, this is where your mustard and ketchup and mayonnaise was all separated. And go to the next slide. Uh, apples, fruit, anything that they touch with their hand, 
um, was individually wrapped behind the scenes with people with gloves on and hard boiled eggs for salad and everything. You can go to the next slide. Uh, peanut butter and jelly. So when you have the people with health concerns or dietary issues, we had peanut butter and jelly uh, in the prepackaged peanut butter and jelly squeezable items. And then the two pieces of bread and the utensils were all put into a Ziploc bag with a napkin and then put inside of a paper bag. So all the all the child or person had to do was pick up a paper bag and move directly to their seat. And that's them setting the setting the trays up for them. So the the campers or youth or adults staff um, did not touch any of the silverware on their own. It was all done before they got there. And you can see it's all set up for them. Go to the next slide. And there's your peanut butter and jellies ready for them just to pick up and go. That might be the last slide. Oh, there's salads. So the salads were pre-made. Uh, they didn't, campers in, in the days of salad bar was gone. They would come up and pick up a salad and go. Um, sometimes the salads were even saran wrapped on top, but mostly they had them out like this. And we had a staff member that actually picked up the bowl and handed it to the person. Uh, this uh, washing stations all over the place, sanitizing, as everybody would know, we everybody was always washing their hands all the time. We had hand sanitizer when, this, when the campers walked in to the dining hall, they were hit with the hand sanitizer and on their way out. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, that's probably the same one from a few minutes ago. And that's, that's it. That's incredibly um, helpful. Thank you so much for that, Mike. Um, I think, you know, one of the um, best practices that I've seen is encouraging folks to eat in in their classroom uh, in you know, smaller groups. So you're limiting exposure. Is, is that something obviously you're you're in a little bit of a different situation, but did you consider that at all? No, uh, we just reduced. So what we did is we took the governor's orders. And so if our dining hall seated 400 people, um, our max capacity inside the dining hall that included the cooks and the staff would be 50%. And we we actually lowered that in some cases. And the same thing with the pool. Uh, if the pool only had 300 people max, then even with the staff, it would be reduced by 50% or less um, or any other room. So the bathrooms are same way. So we have trading posts or little stores. So if if you couldn't figure out what the fire code was, well then we we put people in there, our staff in there, and tried to figure out well what's six feet, and how many people can we safely fit into this bathroom at one time. Thank you. Very very thorough approach, and I know incredibly helpful to the the folks here on the line today. Um, we're going to move now to um, thanks, Mike. We're going to move now to Tracy Hester, who's the director of government affairs for Target. Um, as you all can imagine, Target is dealing with huge numbers of people. I've seen comments here of you know, schools with 2,500 students and such. So I think uh, Target's probably got the best expertise as far as moving people in in that way. Um, so with all the high traffic and many high touch surfaces, what steps has Target taken to keep employees and customers safe? And what have you learned or what have you had to pivot on, Tracy? Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate being here. Um, I want to say a big thanks to Raise Your Hand and the North Texas Commission and the Dallas Regional Chamber. You guys have provided awesome leadership through this pandemic, and I think all of us are trying to learn as we go and um, making sure we're providing a really safe environment for the public. Um, I wanted to share with you today, we, we have learned a lot. Um, in Texas, we have about 25,000 team members. Um, we have about 150 stores. We have uh, three distribution centers, and we have a call center. Um, so a lot of different environments for our um, team members to be inter interacting. Some are interacting with the public, some are just, you know, some of those are more just team member interaction. And we've had to a really kind of think through how are we going to provide a really consistent ex experience that um, the leaders can lead and um, share with the team. And then we can get good results every time and keep everybody safe. That was like kind of the first thing that we, we really wanted to do. Um, we've been investing he heavily in our team members through, through this pandemic. Um, trying to build you know, trust with our team members, the customers and elected leaders um, to, to remain open. We are lucky that we've been operating in all 50 states since the pandemic started. We were deemed essential in every, every locality um, and have been open throughout the whole time. 
Um, so during that time, you know, <laughs> things have changed. We've learned more about the disease, how it's spread, um, and how to create a safe environment. And we've had to make adjustments um, quickly and try to, you know, meet those regulations that were coming as well. Um, you know, and we and we understood that we had been open for a while, but there's a lot of businesses across the country that were going to be having to open as um, at all at once, and they wouldn't kind of get that benefit of knowing what we've done over time. Um, so we wanted to provide some, a resource for um, businesses or other groups that interact with the public. We wanted to provide them something that they could also use um, so that we all can succeed. We, we definitely realize that if we are ever going to get to a new normal and help our uh, economies, we need to make sure that we can get people um, out doing some of the, the things that are considered normal and get people working. So we want to make sure we can share what we have learned. We created a toolkit that we call Safe Retail, but it is something that is just it, that can be used for others in um, anyone who interacts with the public, I would say, and could be used in the in the school setting. Before I go into Safe Retail, I just I want I want to also mention that. Um, Target's teacher discount is going on really soon. Um, it's July 19th through August 29th. It's 15% off school supplies. Um, you can find that information on target.com backslash teacher prep. So just want to make sure we got that out there that that is, that is available to you as well. Um, so let me see if I can share safe retail. Um, I'm going to try to drive. Let's see if this works. So this is the Safe Retail Toolkit. It is a 60 page document. Um, so I'm not gonna go through every single page. I'm just gonna provide you some of the highlights that might, might be relevant. Um, it is in English and Spanish, and it has a lot of really detailed information, particularly on what's cleaned and when, and you know what is used. And um, so I do encourage you to check it out. It's on the Dallas Regional Chambers website, um, but we also can send it to you if you, if you need it. Um, and again, this is not a plus, it's, it's, we try to make this a guide that is detargetized, de so to say, so that anyone can use it. And it can be as general as possible. So it's not just, it's not exactly what we've done, but it is, it's, it's helpful to, to others um, as we go through this. Okay, so safe retail. Um, the S is for screening. Um, so we want to make sure everyone who's coming into the store and who is um, in our employees are, are having a health screen um, at home or on site where it's required. Like, so Dallas is one of those places where it's required for our team members to be screened on site with a temperature. We are um, encouraging all of our team members to do their temperatures at home and other locations. And, we, and then when they get to work, they're asked a series of, of health questions so we can make sure that they are um, healthy when they get there. Um, as well as for customers, we have, um, we have signs on the outside of the store that basically encourages people to not shop when you're sick. Um, we want to make sure that people stay home and um, there's other options available to them when they, you know, if they do have COVID, we have drive up and um, you can get your groceries delivered. And so we're trying to encourage people to use those other options in those cases. Um, I think one of the lessons learned is, you know, when these regulations were coming, Dallas in particular, um, we got heads up that the Dallas um, requirement for temperature check at, at our facility was going into effect about the day before that it was announced. Um, we did not have access to um, th thermometers for about two weeks. Um, they were they were just out of stock and we weren't able to get them. And it was, a, it was not just a target issue, it was an issue for kind of all retailer and all businesses. They just were something that was just high in need at that time and not available. So we tried to um, really try to work around that to meet the requirements and also make sure um, that our young employees are safe and and trying to, to meet that while we didn't really have that technology at our, at, at our disposal and trying to be creative there. So that was something that we learned. And it's, you know, it's some of those regulations just were coming so fast that we just didn't have, have it yet. And we were able to kind of work with the, the leaders and the regulators and saying like, we're working on it, here's our, here's our plan now. And then here's our plan when we actually get the thermometers. Um, and then like access is another, um, we want, employees that don't pass the health screening to stay home. We don't want there to be a, a, any sort of barrier to uh, not, you know, be just to stay home. Like we want, we provide additional benefits like, um, you know, for quarantine pay and sick leave, um, just, just to make sure that those, those employees in this in instance would have all that they needed so they would be able to stay home. 
Um, we also provided additional pay because these were, um, you know, kind of these were workers that were coming to work when a lot of people were staying home. We wanted to make sure that they were they were ben they were given a benefit for that. Um, they were getting two dollars an hour extra, um, you know, for, for their shifts. Um, and now we have just raised our wage. We're now at fifteen dollars an hour across the country. Um, and then we had special hours um, for employees to shop, and then special hours for vulnerable um, populations um, to get access to their essentials. So th those are on Wednesdays. You, you know, we have those vulnerable hours, and it was been a, a really you know big benefit for our team members. Where you know, especially when a lot of the things that they were needing, were, like toilet paper, were things that were being shopped by. Um, everyone else and they want to be able to have special hours so that they could get the things that they needed for their house as well and then access um, to essential items we've had a we had to limit the purchase of different things at different times um, you know there would be like a run on pasta and then a run on <laughs> toilet paper um, a lot of those those um, lines have become much more fluid like you were able to get hand sanitizer now and toilet paper you know in every target store um, so we are going to have worked all those supply chain issues out, but it was, you know, at the time we were kind of limiting things um, as they were coming, you know, story had a lot of ability to limit things. Um, and then, you know, providing different options, you know, in your environment to be e-learning, but for us, it's curbside and delivery so that people can be able to get their things and not come in contact with others. And then face coverings and protective equipment is the F that is um, for employees and customers. Um, I would say here's another lesson learned. We had an employee one for a very long time across the chain. A lot of um, a lot of our team, you know, they're wearing the the face mask. We've kind of worked through a lot of the issues there. Now, our you know, for a while we were providing them for our team, but you know, a lot of people bring their own now. Um, the customers, as I think about 90% of our stores are under a face mask order um, of some kind, and you know, so. Guests are starting to learn that they need to wear a face mask when they go into the, to retail. Um, our signs were very small. They're, they were something that the store could print. So they were like an eight by 11. Um, and you know, they had face, they had you know, information about, there's an you know, emergency order that requires face covering. Um, we had someone at the front reminding people to provide, a, to, to have a face covering. And we had overhead um, announcements reminding people to social distance and, and, and have a face covering. Um, but we were also finding, that um, we needed to have something more. So you know, you'll see in stores now there's going to be a big sign <laughs> that says "Stop! You need a, you need a face covering." Um, and it's also something that our our teams, you know, they feel more safe when people are wearing, um, you know, the mask as well. So we want to try to encourage behavior. And it is encouraging to see that there are so many orders across the country, and people are getting more used to bringing their mask with them. Um, and then other protective me measures. Um, it for retail workers, um, you know, gloves and the plexiglass shields are something that we implemented. Um, those, you know, those are things that we, you know, rolled out as, you know, as we were kind of getting those supplies and making sure that all stores have them. So now all stores have the plexiglass shields at the checkout. And then um, enhanced safety measures. So there's enhanced cleaning protocols um, for every kind of touch transaction. So if you go through the checkout, you'll see they'll the cashier will pause and clean you know, all of the things that are touched regularly during that transaction. Um, those lanes are also you know, um, shut down on a regular basis and then clean completely and, and they move, they'll move to the next lane because they kind of they do every other, other lane as well to kind of make sure they can have one that is being deep cleaned and one that is being surface cleaned. And then we um, are reminding our guests to social distance or signs all over the store. There's markers, you know, for them. We found that those markers work really well to encourage people to stand, you know, um, at a at a at a distance. We also instituted um, metering on our own. Uh, we did also kind of like similar to some of the other speakers mentioned. We did a just a a, a calculation of what. <laughs> Excuse me a second. I'm on a call. Sure. Sorry, I, I also have two two boys. I have an eight year old and ten year old, and I'm also curious what we're gonna do for school and a new puppy. So that's what he was asking me about. Should I take the puppy out? Of course, that's always the answer. Yes, take the puppy out. <laughs> um, yeah. So we 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 line meters. We did a calculation of what is six foot six feet that people can stand in those highly shopped areas. Um, we were seeing you know you know during a lot of the quarantine. 
time in the stay at home orders, people were shopping mostly in the grocery, you know, essential sections. How could we maintain that six foot distance and still um, be able to, you know, in those areas, even though our store is massive, you know, we could have a lot more people than we're allowing, but we want to make sure we in those areas we could have it. It goes down to it's less than about 10% that we're allowing into the store at one time. So there's someone at the front who's, you know, checking on that and, um, you know, making sure that we're not letting in more than what Target has told them that we can provide. Um, so even if the state says we can have 50%, we're not doing that. And a lot of our stores, 50% is like 800 people. We're doing more like 300 or less. So, um, and then, you know, we also had, a, had to turn off some things like you weren't going to get samples. You're not going to get, you know, your temporary change of your, of your return policy, other things to kind of work through what is the, what's happening and making sure we're understanding. So just kind of go through like this guide. I just hope you can check it out. It does have um, things that you can print, you know, you know, if you're not feeling well, please stop and here's some things to kind of check your behavior. Um, you know, to our customers here is again, like, you know, we want you to understand here's some things we expect of you. Mm -hmm. And then if you're not feeling well, don't come into a store to, to spread those germs. Um, and then I will skip this part. Um, the enhanced cleaning routines is something I think would be beneficial for you as well. Um, there's kind of this for staff, they go over what you, what needs to be clean on you know, a regular basis. They have someone who have extra hours for folks to, to do this, like extra payroll hours to just focus on the cleaning. And then what is the enhanced things that need to also be done and you know how and it's kind of a step by step guide of all areas of the store. And Tracy, uh, this is awesome. I think um, I definitely think the overhead reminders and communications and then we probably need to move on to Carter because uh, we're a little sure. past time. Thank you. OK, great. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think the key that I'm taking away from your comments here, Tracy, is communication, 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 <laughs> over communicate. Um, and yes. I think that that's something that we need to, to take away from each of these presentations. Um, even if you don't know the answer right now, I think uh, being comfortable saying as much is really important. But, you know, being very clear about the expectations and, um, uh, you know, being open to making sure, you know, you can answer questions um, of parents and staff. And I think this is all going to be a very, very important part of next steps. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this document. Uh, many people were asking about where to find it. So what we'll do is follow up uh, with an email um, uh, working with with um, North Texas Commission and Raise Your Hand Texas to, to get this out to everyone as follow up. Missy, I know we're past time, um, but we definitely want to hear from Carter. I don't know if uh, you wanted to say anything for folks that are needing to drop off the line or you just want to wait until after we uh, wrap up the conversation. Um, I'll wait till after we wrap up. But in the meantime, in the chat, I will uh, insert the contact information for all of our panelists. Um, and then as I'll, I'll turn the time to you and I'll just have a brief wrap up for about 15 seconds at the end. Perfect. OK, thank you. All right, Carter, thank you so much for for being with us and being patient. Last but certainly not least, uh, Carter Holston is the director of real estate and community relations for NEC Corporation. Um, our uh, we've asked Carter to address um, and I've seen him present on this, so I'm familiar with it, but there was a study that um, came out, maybe it was in June at some point, maybe late May, that was a coronavirus disease outbreak in a call center in South Korea. It was published by the CDC Medical Journal and deals with an outbreak where one person infected 100 people on one floor of an office building. I understand that the results of that study have informed NEC's new operating protocol. Uh, can you describe the new protocols that you're using and your experience with their effectiveness? Uh, Sarah, thank you so much. I, I for sure don't mind batting cleanup uh, after this uh, great lineup of experts. Uh, I think everyone, everyone, the panelists will tell you that they have read volumes of data about uh, what to do and best practices. Um, most of mine came from the real estate industry, uh, but we all have um, 
you know, various resources. Tracy, I love what you did for other retailers. That's that's um, you know very helpful. Um, but you know, ours came from the real estate industry, and and uh, if we could share my or uh, pull up my uh, presentation real quickly, I promise it's just three screens, so uh, this won't take long. Uh, I also saw uh, throughout the presentations, um, Mike, I like what you did about we called it from the front door to the back door. And so we literally walk every office and we thought in terms of what are we trying to communicate? What do we need to do? Uh, how do we do it uh, from floor by floor, front door to back door? So walkabout is really important. Uh, Tracy, your signage, uh, even uh, Carol, the dark signage, I thought that was great. Uh, all those things are really important. I'm not a signage guy. I, I've tried to uh, a limit signage uh, throughout my career, uh, but uh, this is not that time. This is time to communicate and train uh, and train your employees. Uh, we had the uh, opportunity to test the waters, uh, really uh, tiptoe in the water. Uh, we didn't open full all of our offices all at once. And quite frankly, that's what the school systems are being asked to do. And uh, we had the luxury of testing the water first. Uh, we actually had an incident uh, with an employee that turned uh, tested positive even before we were opened. Uh, so it was an engineer that came in to do some testing. Uh, he, you know, he uh, he tests positive and we had to instigate our protocols even while our offices were closed. Uh, so if you could throw up the, the, the one slide that's sort of telling for me on the next page. And this is the Korean study. Uh, this was a call center on one floor, the 11th floor of this building uh, in South Korea. And the blue uh, indicates those that were infected. So one person infected uh, 94 uh, people out of 216. But what's really telling to me about this particular uh, picture is, is that we've all really been focusing, uh, and, and rightly so, Tracy, uh, focusing on touch surfaces, uh, Mike touch, touching on uh, Carol, where people touch and cleaning and, and doing cleaning protocol. I, I think that's, um, we've gotten that down pretty good. Everybody has. Uh, but where the real challenges uh, are, are that we're all facing uh, is through droplets and air transfer. And that's what's really occurring if you look at this one picture. Uh, this was a call center. This is Asian, st Asian style, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, the supervisor sits on the end of the row and everyone's uh, next to each other. A very uh, cramped quarters. Uh, you can see that they share a common bathroom. They share elevators. But what's most interesting to me is there's very few infections on what we'll call the south side of the building. On the north side, you see extreme amount of exposure, and that tells me uh, that it was droplets and airflow. So social distancing uh, is really uh, of paramount importance. Uh, face mask, uh, extremely important. Uh, so while we're focused really on touch services, I think we really need to be thinking about how do we separate people? And um, that, that's that's really how we formulated our whole uh, our whole plan was uh, after reviewing this. So signage training. Um, the the last thing I really want to point out is access control. Uh, in our case, when we had someone test positive, we need to know who was there on that day uh, so that we could inform them. So being able to uh, control the front desk, uh, I think we've all. Uh, I know I've done it. Uh, I've gone to the back door of the school uh, because they know me and I walk in. Uh, we can't do that any longer. You need to know exactly who is in each area all day long in case there's an event so that you can inform others that they've been exposed in close proximity. So uh, in, in corporate America, we always, uh, in, especially in Texas, uh, we hold the door open for one another uh, to be courteous. And uh, we can't do that any longer. We need everyone badging in so that we know uh, who's in and at what times in case there is an incident. Uh, so that's really uh, another lesson learned. Um, I, I will close with this thought, and uh, I know I've seen it with Target 
I know I've seen it with at and I know I've seen it with Verizon. Uh, and I say this to all the school districts, uh, please um, reach out to your corporate partners. Uh, we're here to help in funding gaps. We're here to help with best practices. Uh, you're not going it alone. We're all vested partners in this community. And I applaud um, the DRC uh, and others that are, are putting forth, putting businesses together with education. Uh, we, we, we stand with you uh, and we are, we're here to help you any way we can, whether it's funding a resource that's been cut, uh, whether it's finding ways to work around the things that we've done to work around situations. Uh, I really wanted to reinforce that. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much uh, for allowing us to speak today. Of course, Carter, we appreciate that. There's so, so, so many questions I wish we could get to um, this morning. I, you know, we talked a little bit about technologies that can be used um, to disinfect spaces. Uh, Carol, thanks for sharing that information. That same technology can be installed in HVAC systems in schools, and that that has been proven uh, to kill this virus and can be very effective. Um, there are on. Go ahead. Um, can we throw up one more slide? I, I think there was a question about um, uh, thermal detection and uh, temperatures. Yes. Uh, testing temperatures. Yes. Um, and, and that's sort of a, a really tough area because you don't want to get in close proximity with someone that is infected. Um, right. So there is technology out there. Uh, you can, um, we, we have it, uh, it's thermal detection and it'll test uh, actually crowds. So if you put a red box around someone uh, who is um, potentially infected. So yeah, there, that's just a quick picture, but in the bottom right hand corner, you can see uh, people walking in uh, upper left, they're walking in. There's a camera, a thermal detection device, and it would actually it could also, it could identify who they are if that's necessary, or it can just identify that this person has an elevated temperature over 100 degrees. Uh, that technology is out there, uh, and you'll and and that's here to stay. You'll see that in every office building. Uh, you'll see it in retail. You'll see it in in, um, in, in schools as well. Uh, so just wanted to throw that up and and uh, let you know that 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 you don't have to individually check each person. Uh, however, that might be the most cost effective way to do it uh, in your scenario. In the short term, that's right. Um, obviously, lots of technological, I think, innovations and advances that are coming in this space. And I was going to say some of these disinfection technologies like um, the UV cleaning technologies or electrostatic uh, uh, cleaning technologies are actually fairly inexpensive um, and could be worth investigating and we'd be happy to share some additional information about uh, what's available out there um, and how you can access those. This has been um, a lot of information and Missy, I think we talked early on as we were uh, starting to put this together to say, you know, this may need to be the first of several conversations. Um, I think Carter said it very well, you know, the business community is here to support our schools. We know that you are making incredibly difficult and important, important decisions right now. Uh, we really want to be supportive and helpful of you in that. So, so let us know um, what we can do. Uh, one question was asked about uh, additional resources that might be available um, on other uh, places that are dealing with similar issues and how they're tackling it. I know the DRC has a, a website at dallaschamber.org slash future of work. Uh, what we have done is taken um, all of the guidelines uh, at the state level uh, from the CDC, from OSHA, um, and uh, recommendations that have come out from the Lieutenant Governor's Office, from, uh, you know, all different resources and compiled those onto that website. Um, we have a quick downloadable two-page document. Um, as, a, as we mentioned earlier, this is the seventh in our series. Um, of the future of work and business um, uh, around a responsible return. And we have compiled all of our learnings into a quick two page document. Um, Patricia just uh, posted a link to that here in the chat and we'll make sure to get this information out to you. Um, we are uploading um, the education information, hopefully later today to that website um, that compiles again, all of the 
regulations and uh, links out to resources. So that will be available. It is fast changing. As you all saw uh, last night, Governor Abbott mentioned that uh, schools are, uh, it'll be announced in the next couple of days that schools will be um, able to operate virtually longer than was part of the original plan. So I think uh, flexibility, offering each other grace, <laughs> communications, uh, those those are are the key takeaways from today. So, Missy, I'll I'll turn it back to you. But a very very big thank you to North Texas Commission and Raise Your Hand Texas for your partnership on this, on this meeting. And I return the thanks to you as well, uh, Sarah, and the whole team at uh, Dallas Regional Chamber. You guys have been an incredible partner along with the North Texas Commission. Um, we want to thank together all of our panelists. Uh, Carter, you said it so correctly. We are in all of this together. And we appreciate so much the support from the business community into the education community because we can't do it without you. Um, thank you for taking your time to share your experiences with the education community today. If you would like to follow up with any of the five panelists, um, I put their contact information over in the chat. Uh, I also dropped in some contact information for me and Sarah and Annette's information is in there as well. We appreciate that you've chosen to attend this event. We hope you've learned something that can help to inform the decisions that you have to make. Um, we will be sending to you additional information, a link to this to the whole uh, video and the other presentation materials that were used. Feel free to follow up with us to let us know how we can support you. And um, we're just delighted to have you with us and uh, best wishes as you make the important decisions ahead of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.